fall asleep with a cigarette in his hand. One night he did this and he set light to the sofa that he was lying on and they just threw it out of the window. I mean, it was a sort of very Oxford undergraduate type thing. So f uh, that Christmas they dined on turkey stuffed by Lee Fermor with benzedrine tablets and uh, they wanted a cocktail. Sophie remembered that in Poland they had this lovely cocktail made from vodka and soft fruit. No vodka, no soft fruit. So what did she have? She got raw alcohol and prunes and she poured it into a big uh, basin, left it for two days. The first person to try it collapsed. <laughs> uh, and it was that sort of thing. And all of this was looked over by a woman called uh, Madame Chayat, who lived in the attic. Nobody ever saw her. She didn't exist. She'd been invented by Moss to protect Sophie's virtue. So that there was, they could always refer to Madame Chayat, but you won't meet her today because she's very, very ill. Um, uh, whilst all this was going on, uh, Muller, the, the butcher of Crete, was taken off Crete. He was sent into Europe, and his place was taken by a man called General Kreiper, Heinrich Kreiper. Kreiper was a brave man. He was a classicist. He'd fought for two years on the Eastern Front. He was the holder of two iron crosses, one uh, the highest you could get if, uh, other than the, the one held by uh, Hermann Goering. And he was told, look, we're sending you to Crete. It's a very cushy number. It's nice. It's hot. You've come from the terrible winter and the terrible conditions on the Eastern Front. Uh, you're going to have a good time. Don't worry about the resistance because they, they're, they're, they're nothing. They're just a load of disorganized um, peasants. So come to Crete and have, and have a holiday. So his plane lands at Malamy airfield. Uh, he's met by an honor guard, a lovely car, a, an Opel Capitan, top of the range motor car, cruises up, wonderful chauffeur. He gets in it and he's driven first to Heraklion, to his headquarters there. What he doesn't realize is that every inch of the way he's being watched. These ignorant peasants have got a very, very, very good resistance organization going. They watch him. He goes into his headquarters. The lovely young women who serve him coffee, the Greek, smiling Greek women, he does not realize that they are undercover resistance agents there to keep an eye on him. He has his coffee, he meets his, his staff, he drives on to the Villa Ariadne, which was the home of the British Archaeological School that the, um, the Germans had taken it over. And again, he's welcomed by a nice young woman. He, he waves at a nice young woman who's the, the daughter of the late caretaker of the house. She's a spy, she's watching him, she's reporting what's happened. So that hot Greek afternoon in the spring, he goes into his study, he takes his coat off, he relaxes, and he doesn't realize that he's entered a trap. And when that trap springs, it's gonna cost him his career, his reputation, uh, and it's nearly gonna cost him uh, his life. Then you might ask, wh what was he doing there at all? And the answer is that, uh, uh, that in uh, May 1940, on the 20th of May 1940, the largest airborne force ever mounted uh, flew over Crete and paratroopers and gliders began to land on the island. They were out, a paratroop, a paratroop force is very, very vulnerable. They've got to get there and grab their, um, uh, their target immediately, or otherwise they'll be wiped out as we saw with our own paratroop force at Arnhem. These guys, they landed. The whole island rose up against them, not just the soldiers, and they were outnumbered two to one. There were something like 40,000 British and Commonwealth troops on, that, uh, on, that, on the island, including some Indian uh, r regiments. Uh, and they fought them, the, but the islanders themselves fought them. They, gra they grabbed anything they could from 303 rifles to hatchets, anything and they began to attack, attack the Germans. The general in charge of the defense of the island was called Freyberg, and he was a New Zealander, and he was obsessed with the idea that the invasion, when it came, would come from the sea. So he forbade the guns that were pointing out to sea, six-inch um, six guns, very, very powerful. He forbade them to, to traverse onto the airfields. And at the end of the first day, uh, it was going very, very badly indeed for the, for the German invaders so badly that they, they, decided, they were deciding in Berlin to, pull the whole, to call the whole thing off. That night, by some uh, a, a command uh, cock-up, we, we left Mal Malamy Airfield, which meant that the next day a German heavy lift airplane landed. It was shelled, but he, the pilot was sent to see 
if it was possible, as a last-ditch thing, to land uh, airplanes that were carrying vehicles and heavy guns. He did, he did land. He took off immediately. He was then followed in by uh, squadrons of heavy liftings, and slowly through that day, more and more Germans arrived on the island. The British and the Commonwealth forces were deeply um, demoralized by what was happening, and they pretty well gave in. And they, and they had all the equipment they needed to beat the Germans off, but, but they weren't able um, to do that. And so uh, the, the islanders kept on fighting. There were many, many acts of great bravery by um, priests, children, women. They all, they all felt, uh, and the Cretans still do feel, that, they have to, that they, they're likely to be... Um, you know, to be uh, in, invaded again. And, and so they're, they're very used to defending themselves. Um, but slowly the Germans took control, and it ended, the, the British army was routed. It, most of the soldiers on the island went south uh, to try and get it to be evacuated to Egypt. After 11 days, the battle ended. We had 12,000 prisoners, 12,000 uh, Allied prisoners, 2,000 dead. And of the 12,000, there were some people who had been uh, badly wounded. So Crete had taken a real battering. The north coast of Crete took a real battering, and this is um, called Lion Square. It's the site of the oldest slave market in, in Europe. Uh, but uh, at the end of this battle, the Germans used that fountain to wash their parachutes in, which, you know, which was very sort of insulting to the Cretan people. And the, the Germans themselves were furious. Um, one, of, one of the people who died in this battle was an archaeologist called John Pendlebury, who is more Cretan and the Cretans. And one thing that Pendlebury had, had been able to do before the war was to set up the, a rudimentary sort of skeletal resistance force. He'd, he'd um, uh, collaborated with the Cretans saying, to say that if the Germans come, this is how we might resist them. But unfortunately, he died in the, on the first day. The Germans immediately began to, so to, to search out the people who'd fought against them. Uh, they, they, uh, they, they visited the villages, they rounded up the, um, the men and the women and the children, uh, they separated them and interrogated them very, very in a very rudimentary and, br and brutal way, and then they shot the men and the, and the, and the male children. Uh, they just led them off and shot them, and there was a, a photographer, uh, with a, a German war photographer called... Um, uh, Franz Weichsler, and Weichsler had his Leica with him, and he was horrified by what he saw, and he photographed the executions, and the, here are the German, there's a German firing squad, and, and that's what they were doing. And um, Weichsler was court-martialed for taking these photographs, and he, he lived to the end of the war, and his testimony at the Nuremberg rally contributed to the, uh, to the <laughs> Nuremberg trials, thank you, contributed to um, Goering being uh, c condemned as a war criminal, though he committed suicide before he could be executed. Um, but the, uh, the Nuremberg war, war cr um, crime rally, uh, the Nuremberg war crime tribunal. So the Germans have completely antagonized the Cretans. The resistance has, has begun. Uh, a key person in the resistance was this chap who's just on the left of frame there with the, with the peaked cap on. He's helping the mayor of Heraklion surrender. He'd lost everything in the battle, so he went to his small holding on the south coast and, li and began to live as a peasant. Uh, this is him in his pe dressed as a peasant, and what he did, he, he discovered four men who were planning to sail an open boat to Egypt, to Cairo, and he said, you'll never make it, and they said, well, we're going to try anyway. It was a very battered old boat. He said, well, if you do go, take this message, and it was literally a message in a bottle, take it to general head headquarters in Cairo, and the message said, says that in a month's time, I, I, the colonel, will be waiting on this beach, and you are to send somebody to make contact with me. And the colonel, Philip Parkes, he was on that beach with his son at night. He lit a fire. The wood was wet. He had s his eyes were streaming from the smoke. Out to sea, they saw a red light flashing, and they thought, oh, this is awful. These are ger that's a German boat out there, but it wasn't. It was a dinghy with two British sailors in. They, they rowed ashore. They said, are you Colonel Philipparkis? Yes. They said, we are instructed to tell you that in one month's time, you'll be prepared to meet two British officers who will, who will make contact with you. And sure enough, uh, a month later, there was a knock on his door. And standing outside his house, his little tiny um, house, were two British officers, Jack Smith Hughes from the Special Operations Executive, 
and Ralph, Corporal Ralph Stockbridge from the Inter-Services Liaison Department. And very, very uh, crudely, the, SO, the SOE uh, agents were interested in blowing things up. They liked sabotage, they liked destruction. The ISLD were more intellectual and they thought it was more useful to collect intelligence and from the hundreds and hundreds of tiny bits of I, I, each piece is fairly meaningless, but those bits of intelligence add up to the big picture, and, and they were able to let Cairo know, let General Headquarters know what Germans were on the island, what units were in transit, who was heading to, um, to, to fight in the, we in, the, in, the, in the Western Desert. And one officer said that, uh, you know, that, without, that without that intelligence, we, we could easily have lost the war in the desert to Rommel. Um, the other... Um, sort of motive in this was Churchill's who wanted Greece to remain the patrician figure of Churchill. He wanted Greece to remain a monarchy and that's what his interest, he was, he was terrified that the, the communists would take over. Uh, anyway, um, so these two men, they arrive, they make contact and the resistance has started and it's getting help now from, from, from Egypt, from the British and the islanders have a pretty hard time of it. They're, they're, they're forced into labor the, the men and women, they have to build airfields and, and generally do everything that the, uh, the Germans want them to do. And their food is taken away, their, uh, their food is, is requisitioned, they're paid pitiful amounts of money. For a cow, a farmer could expect to get enough money to buy six eggs. So he, he swaps his cow for six eggs. It was, uh, you know, there was starvation all over Gr Greece and, um, and Crete. So the anger on the part of the Cretans grows and grows and grows and they begin to fight back. Here you can see a motorcyclist who's been shot. They pay a very, very big price for this because for every uh, German who dies, at least 10 Cretans are murdered. Um, uh, it, it, it was, it was, I think it was pretty awful to be on Crete at that time. And they don't only murder the, uh, the islanders, they blow up their, their villages uh, the, the, the two villages where we saw the, the um, firing squad, they were, they were dynamited and then dive-bombed just to make sure that they, they wouldn't do any more. They were totally destroyed, and they've since been rebuilt. Um, leading the guerrillas were these men who were called uh, uh, capitans, and there were about 50 of them on the island. Three or four of them were very, very powerful indeed. This, this man, Capitan Petrarca Yorgi, was called Selfridge as his code name because before the war he'd been a merchant, and he'd armed his resistance men. Out, uh, he paid for their weapons and ammunition and food and clothing out of his own um, uh, pocket. The woman who, for me, uh, typifies uh, the, the sort of the suffering and the, and the resilience of the island is the lady at the center of this photograph. She's called Mrs. Dramudanis, and she's a very young woman here with her children. Her husband was a cap capitan. Her son was a resistance fighter. They were both executed by the Germans. Her life was in danger. She fled to live in the caves and in the hills with the resistance. And as you can see, her two young sons are both carrying submachine guns. And one of those submachine guns uh, is still in Heraklion today. And I've, I've uh, rather thrillingly held it myself. It was lovely. <laughs> um, anyway, Mrs. Dramadan is, is, a, is, I think, a wonderful, um, a wonderful person. Back in Cairo, the, the plan to, to capture the general has been given the, uh, the go-ahead by, general, by the uh, general headquarters. Lee Fermer is going to lead the uh, mission. Uh, Moss is his second in command. The problem with Moss is that he can't speak Greek and he's never been to Crete before. So that's not a, very, uh, that's not a very good position to be in if you're going to lead a mission. The Greek leaders of the mission was this guy, uh, Manolis Patarakis, who'd worked with Lee Fermer for the last 18 months, he's a shepherd, he, he knows exactly what he's doing, and he becomes really uh, the second in command of the, of the mission. And he's joined uh, by another chap called uh, Georgios Tirakis, and those are the two leading um, Cre Cretans. On the night before they set off for Crete, they have a party. It was traditional at Tara to have a party to send people off. One of the agents in, in the... Um, in the house was Zan Fielding. He'd already been operating in the Balkans, and he pulled out two books during the, during the drinking, heavy drinking night, the Oxford Eng Book of English Poetry and the complete works of Shakespeare, and he gave them to Moss and to Lee Fermer, and he said, <coughs> sorry, 
They bought me luck in the Balkans. Let's hope they bring you luck. Um, and uh, Sophie, Sophie Tarnowska wrote in her diary, I'll read it to you, uh, on the eve of an agent's deployment, there'd be a big party and a car would call and those who were going to be dropped into enemy ter territory left just like that, without a goodbye, without anything. We never allowed ourselves to be anxious about them. We believed that to be anxious was to accept the possibility of something dreadful happening to them. So <coughs> you've got the undergraduate pranks in Cairo, but when they go into the field, it is very, very much the real thing. Their lives are going to be in danger. If they're, if they're captured, they're going to be t brutally tortured. They take huge risks. Lee Fermer and Moss took with them a, a list of equipment that weighed half a ton, and it, it reads like a, something out of a boy's own paper. I mean, they ha I'll read you some of the things they had. They had maps, pistols, bombs, koshes, commando daggers, knuckle, knuckle dusters, telescopic sights, silencers, benzodrine tablets, morphine, knockout drops, and suicide pills. So with all this kit and some German uniforms, because they thought that they might be disguising themselves as Germans, they set off in this Handley Page specially adapted bomber, flew uh, to the island. Uh, Lee Fermer was the first person to jump. They couldn't all jump together in a stick. The, the hole in the, in the airplane was too small, so they had to jump out separately. It's night. Lee Fermer uh, lands. He's met by Sandy Rendell, who's a, a SOE officer, and, and Cretans that he knew who call him Livermore, Livermore. And they're all shouting and, and uh, congratulating him. He's Apparently, when you parachute, you get very thirsty. He's dying for a drink of water or something stronger. As he's saying this, the cloud cover closes in overhead, and they can hear but not see the plane as it now circles. And the pilot takes another hour to try and find a break in the clouds so he can drop these men. It doesn't happen, uh, and he flies back with all the equipment and with three of the agents. And Lee, Lee Firm has left on the island, uh, and he spends a lot of time writing letters to his girlfriends uh, some of which I've read, and they're in the Imperial War Museum, and moaning about the inefficiency, slightly unfairly, about the inefficiency of the, um, of the Royal Air Force. And it's about nearly two months later before um, the other three, with, with a lot of other Cretans, return to the island, and this time by uh, motor launch. Um, the, the th uh, again, the fact that Moss couldn't speak Greek and didn't know the island meant that he couldn't really read the people who were with him. And there was a, a very brave cap capitan there called Yanni Katsias, uh, who was the victim of a vendetta. And, Mo and Moss thought that he was just a sheep stealer. He, he describes him as a, as a villainous looking sheep stealer. In fact, he wasn't a villainous looking sheep stealer. He was a very clever, brave man who'd been taken off the island to get him out of, um, uh, out of, uh, get him out of, the, out of the vendetta. And, and it was a sort of common mistake of all the uh, SOE agents to, th to treat sheep stealing as a sort of a joke. It's a very, very serious thing on, on Crete to start um, stealing, stealing a man's sheep, and it can lead to d vendettas that can go on for decades. Uh, anyway, uh, so he can't read, so he, Moss gets off the boat, uh, he gets in the dinghy, he's taken ashore, and he, as far as he's concerned, he's surrounded by the cast of a Gilbert and Sullivan opera. They've all got daggers and uh, you know, cummerbunds on, they're all roughly shaven, and a filthy, disgusting looking man with a coat tied up with string and flappy shoes that are disintegrating. He walks up to him and he thinks, oh, here's a, my first crease. And the, and the guy goes, hello, Billy. Uh, you don't know me. Paddy will be here in a, along in a minute. I haven't washed for six months. Man of the people, that's me. And that's Sandy Rendell. And then, and then Lee Fermer himself appears, dressed like that. Uh, that photograph, he's actually got written, Lee Fermer, Paddy's written on the back of it, Balderdash. He's, he never really quite dressed up like that, but he did, he did wear grand clothes, and he said to um, uh, Moss, he said, I want the people to think of me as a sort of duke, and that's what he, and he did. He impressed his personality on them. They go off to their first base, the house of a man called Kimon Zographistos, and they are fated on the way. These people who have no food and are suffering. Nevertheless, they'll kill a sheep, they'll kill a goat, they'll get the wine from somewhere, and they give them a really good time. And Moss said, uh, Moss on the subject of wine, he says, um, wine takes the place of one's morning cup of tea, and one often drinks a liberal quantity before brushing one's teeth. So when they weren't moving around, and moving across the island was a very, very difficult thing, they were having a, a high old time, and who, uh, who can blame them? So they get to their first, first base, and then they 
Lee Fermer and a man called Mickey Akumianakis, who's the head of uh, counterintelligence on Crete, and he's in this very bad snapshot shot, but it's so thrilling to see him that I've included it, set off to recce the route through Heraklion that they might take with the general. And they also go to recce the Villa Ariadne, which is the general's home. And the original plan was to break into the villa, kidnap the general, and then fight their way out of the villa. Once they began to look at it, and they can look at it from Mickey's house, Mickey's father was the caretaker uh, who was killed in the battle, and so he knows the house well, and they can, they can sit in one of the rooms and look at it, and they realize it's surrounded by three layers of barbed wire. It's got um, heavy machine guns around it. This is the house today. It's got guards. It's got barriers. If they could get in, that would be difficult, but getting out would be suicidal. So they decide to change the plan, uh, and they think that, that what they'll do is they'll, they'll, they'll wave the general's car down and stop him uh, as he's on, en route uh, one evening to back home. And they get hold of a very nice student called the El Elias Athanasakis, who agrees to study the general and to get to know the car so well that he can identify it by the noise of its engine, even in the dark. And he also undertakes to uh, make a signaling system so that they can be three or 400 yards away from the kidnap point and send a message down a, a bell wire that will ring a bell to say the car is on its way. And so the plan is now set. They'll wave the car down, they'll grab the general, and they'll drive him to the south coast and, they, and be taken off by motor launch. And they want the BBC, they'll tell the BBC that when they've successfully got him, they'll, tell, they'll get the BBC to transmit a, 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 a news broadcast saying the general has been taken off the island. And, so, and by doing that, they hope that they'll stop the Germans looking for them. They then celebrate Easter and there's lots more drinking. A guy called Captain Gutzalis arrives and he, um, he, his role is to, is to be a backup for the, to defend the kidnappers. The 12 kidnappers will grab the general. Gutzalis and his guys will, um, will defend them if anybody comes along that, that they weren't expecting. Um, oh, it's going backwards. That shouldn't happen. There we are. Um, the night of the, the, the capture is due to take place, the day before the capture is due to take place, which is the 24th of April, uh, they get news that the general has changed his routine. And they think, oh my goodness, that they've discovered that we're here. There are, a lot of, there are now about 40 resistance workers, very, very difficult for the, um, the local village to support them. And so reluctantly, they, they say, uh, Butsalis, must, you must take your men away. So they're now reduced down to the original 12 men. Everybody's getting very, very jumpy. The man whose house they're in is getting almost hysterical, and they're worried that he's going to go away and tell the Germans. They get a letter from the um, National Organization of Crete, which is pro-British, saying, if you go ahead with this kidnap, we will uh, betray you to the Germans. And later on, Moss and uh, Lee Fermer said, said that this was the communists. It wasn't the communists. It was, um, it, it was a, it a pro-British organization. In the end, they all agree, no, we're, get, we, we're here to kidnap the general. We will do that. The general's routine is, um, is re-established. And so two days after the night that they were originally planning to do it, they dress up in these uniforms. Moss said that uh, Lee Fermer looked worryingly like the real thing. Whereas he, he, he himself, he thought, would look, just look like a British officer pretending to be a German lolling around in a London, a London bar. And they all move off to the kidnap point, uh, which you can't see in the slide because it's gone blank for some reason. Um, but this is a very exciting photograph because this is a reconstruction of the kidnap uh, as organized and photographed by Paddy Lee Fermer himself. And he's written on the back of this photograph, the car is in the exact place that it was on the night of the capture. So they're now in the ditches. They've bought, Zo they bought the man in whose house they were staying with them because they're worried that they, they kept him as a sort of hostage. Uh, they're waiting for the car. The, they don't realize that the general is, has agreed to play bridge with his officers that evening, so he's much later than he should be. Other vehicles go by, a motorcycle goes by, lorries full of uh, soldiers go by, and then, and then they get the signal, which isn't now the, the bell wire, but uh, flashing torches. The bell wire was thought to be too uh, cumbersome. They see the torches flashing. The general's coming. Lee Fermer and Moss scramble out of the ditches. 
Moss has got a sort of traffic paddle with a red and a white thing on it, which is a signal for the car to stop. Lee Firma's got a torch. Moss has got a, uh, a cosh in his hand, which is like a heavy hammer covered in leather. And they've both got uh, pistols stuck in the back of their, um, uh, of their trousers. And the, and the general can see these German soldiers, apparently policemen, waving him down. He's very, very pleased because he thought that if, I w if he was to be captured or assassinated, this is the spot that it would happen. And he thinks, this is marvelous. I've, I've ordered that they should defend this place. And here are the men already. They've got a, they're, they're, they're getting a, a, you know, a, 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 a patrol point ready. And tomorrow it'll be even stronger and I'll be, and I'll be safe. He's smiling. He reaches into his pocket. Lee Firma comes up going, Generalswagen, Papierenbitter. The general begins to pull the papers out of his pocket, smiling, happy. The car doors are ripped open. He's dragged out of the car. The other men hiding in the ditch leap upon him. He's swearing. He punches Lee Firma in the face. Moss grabs the driver. He whacks him over the head. They leap in the car. They tie the, the, the resistance tie the general up. They lay him in the back of the car. Three of them get in on top of him, stinking men of, who, you know, who've not washed for, for months and months and months. This is a man who uh, uh, only a minutes before was playing bridge with his officers. And they drive off. Uh, and they head off to... Um, to Heraklion, um, and it's taken them 90 seconds from the moment they stop the car to the moment it's going, uh, it's going away. And as they drive off, a lorry full of Germans uh, drives past them, he heading to or out of um, Heraklion. Now the difficult bit starts. They've got to get through 22 roadblocks going through Heraklion. Uh, the general's car has pennants on it, uh, and those pennants still exist. Uh, and whenever the soldiers at the, at the roadblock see the, uh, the pennants, uh, Lee Firma shouts out, Genolswagen, and they all snap to attention, and up goes the barriers, and the car drives through. They reach uh, the main street of Heraklion, which is this, this street. They drive down there. That is the gen that's the German headquarters. Further down the street, there's a cinema where the Germans are watching a movie. They're all coming out. The whole place is, is heaving with... Uh, with soldiers and M Moss, who's a very good driver, just keeps going ho hooting. They shout, Genolswagen, and all the Germans get out of the way and salute, click their heels together until um, the kidnappers reach um, uh, the west gate out of, uh, out of Heraklion, which I think is called the Karnia Gate. And this has got searchlights, it's got huge great concrete blocks, it's got the cars can't just drive straight at it, they have to sort of slalom through the concrete blocks. It's got barbed wire, and it's got, above all, it's got a very big German field policeman with a plate across his chest, and he's standing there, and he does not get out of the way. He's got his, holding his hand up, and, and they, the kidnappers had thought that if the kidnap went wrong, this is the place that it would be most likely to go wrong. They would just abandon the general and, and sort of leg it through the back streets of Heraklion, and if necessary, they would take their suicide pills, because the Germans would take a very, very dim view of anybody kidnapping the second in command of the island. And that very last minute, um, Lee Firma d pulls the same stunt, Generalswagen, and the big German gets out of the way, goes, Generalswagen, the, the thing goes, the, the barrier goes up, and he, they shoot out, heading, um, heading, heading west. When Moss took, started to drive the car, he could just see the uh, unconscious figure of the driver being dragged off the road. And the plan is that they'll meet the driver uh, they'll abandon the car and, the gen and they'll walk the general to a village called Anoya, and that will be the first uh, rendezvous place. And they, it's all going um, very well for them. They, d they do abandon the car, and they leave in the car a letter. The gen they, they stop. The general goes off with one team. Lee Firma, ba who's a bad driver, he takes the car on. Moss goes with the general. And they s the, the letter says, we would like to point out most emphatically that this operation has been carried out without the help of Cretans or Cretan partisans, and on the only guide used were serving soldiers of, her, of his Hellenic Majesty's forces in the Middle East who came with us. Any reprisals against the local population will be wholly unwarranted and unjust. P.S. We are very sorry to have to leave behind this beautiful car. <laughs> The, the business of reprisals would haunt Lee Firma for the rest of his life. And if you look in his archive, in, Scot in the John Murray archive in Scotland, his papers, there's, it, he's always coming back to the business, trying to prove that there were no reprisals.
What they also don't know is that the driver is never going to meet them because within minutes of being dragged off the road, he's not only had his throat cut by the partisans, they've cut his head off. And that head was still in on Crete uh, in a village as a sort of souvenir up to about eight years ago when it was finally returned to the German military cemetery. And the death of the driver also was, a, was something that haunted, uh, you know, he hadn't planned that anybody would be seriously hurt in this exercise and, and he worried a great deal about it. Anyway, he, he gets to Anoya, where, where and at the, the rendezvous point is outside Anoya, cannot understand why doors are slammed in his face, people spit on the floor, and remember it's dark, it's only dawn is only just coming, uh, and he hears people saying the black cattle have strayed into the sheep, our in-laws have arrived, and then he suddenly realizes that he's dressed in the darkness, in the gloom, as a German soldier. So what the, what the Cretans are seeing is a German soldier, and once he reveals himself, they, uh, they, all, they all welcome him and congratulate him, and they take him to the cave where the others are, where the, ger where the generals arrive. And now things start to go wrong because an agent called D D Tom Dunbarbin was meant to be there with a radio to tell Cairo that the, the, the um, operation was a success. Dunbarbin, who's a senior officer, disapproved of the kidnap, and he somehow absented himself. He was ill. I thought he might have had malaria, but he... He's, he was very, very sort of ambivalent about it later in life. There, his radio operator is there with the radio, and they start to transmit, and then the radio breaks. So they've now got no way of telling Cairo that they're, that they're on their way. They've got no way of um, finding out where the rendezvous beach uh, will be. And th the only way they can deal with this is to use runners. And I, d if I don't know whether you know Crete, but Crete, the distances aren't very far, but the, but the going is very, very difficult indeed. You go up and down and up and down. And these runners, one of whom Willie mentioned, is George um, Sikandakis, that's the driver. Um, it, the, the, these runners do uh, cover immense distances. And Sikandakis uh, is one of them ha ha trying to find a radio, trying to get the message back to London and to get from London or from Cairo where, where, they, where they should all um, be, go be going to. And... Uh, they're hindered in this by the fact that 2,000 Germans are now on their way to the other side of the mountain, which they've got to cross to get to the south coast. 2,000 Germans are there to cordon off the mountains and stop them getting, uh, getting away. Uh, and they start to climb. They climb up, up through the snow line. And the general's wearing the clothes that he put on for an evening at a bridge. You know, he's got not they've got uh, uh, proper hiking clothes on. It's a, and this is some of the dif most difficult going in Europe. They climb high above the snow line. On the other side, they get a note saying, for God's sake, come tonight. They descend the mountain in the dark. It's very, very difficult. The, German, the general falls off the mule that they've got for him at one point and, and hurts his arm. When they get to the bottom of the mountain, there are people there staring at them aghast, saying, what on earth are you doing here? And they said, well, we thought you said to come tonight. They said, no. The message said, for God's sake, don't come tonight. And somehow they've managed to get through the, down the mountain and through a cordon of, um, of German soldiers. And, and so, it goes, uh, so it goes on, and they both, the, the two British officers, develop a relationship with the general. Famously, the general at one point, they've stopped to eat something or to rest. He looks up at the snow, line, at the snow on the, on the uh, mountain, and he goes, Vides ut alta stet nive Candidum Soracti, which is an ode from Horace that Lee Fermer happens to know by heart, and Lee Fermer uh, finishes the ode, and that's a bond between Lee Fermer and the general. Um, Moss gets on much more badly with him. Moss doesn't like him, and later on the, the general said, um, Paddy, I liked Paddy, but Moss always with his pistol, it was childish. And Moss at one point gets, with great difficulty, gets a German edition of the 1001, you know, the Arabian Nights, gives it to the German, says to the general who's been saying he wants to read it, and the general throws it away. Uh, and, Mo and Moss wrote in his diary, I could have killed him. And incidentally, Moss, oh, whilst this is happening, Moss is keeping a diary and a photographic record of what they were doing, which had it been captured, would have been a death sentence to everybody um, involved. Uh, Eventually, uh, George Sikkim Darkis, uh, one of the runners, gets through to Sandy Rendell, who's miles away. He radios London, now London, n n uh, and says to the BBC, will you send the 
broadcasts, uh, the, will you broadcast the, uh, that the general is no longer on the island? The, the cable, the signal reaches London in the night, and Sunday night, uh, and there's nobody on duty to do anything about it. So the person who received the signal is told, oh, we'll just put it in the in tray, we'll deal with it tomorrow. There are men on Crete upon whose, you know, whose lives depend upon this signal uh, getting to it. It takes them another 18 hours before they agree not to transmit that the general's off, but to say that he's being taken off the island, which is useless because that tells the Germans that he's, that he's still um, there. And I've worked for the BBC, and I do know the glacial slowness with which it can work, you know, come, in, come hell or high water. They're not going to, uh, you know, they're not going to breach their own protocols. The general is astonished at the way the Cretans are helping the British. The, the whole little party is being passed on like a, like a parcel, like a baton from village to village. Defend, they, they can see on the hills above them uh, resistance workers walking along, guarding them, watching them, protecting, uh, you know, keeping watch out for what's happening ahead. And he says to a Cretan woman, why are you uh, being so nice to them? He said, because he thinks that they like the Germans. And she says, it's because the British are fighting for our freedom while you Germans have deprived us of it in a barbarous way. They still have no radio with them, and so Lee Fermer makes a, a, what I think is a mistake. He goes off with George, he sets off with George Tirakis. He leaves uh, Moss with the generals, and Moss really can't do very much because he's not being able to speak the language. And they set off, and they, in the next three days, they cover 50 kilometers looking for a radio, and Ralph Stockbridge finally gets a message through to him, and Ralph was one of those two men who who arrived on the island with, with the colonel. And the, mes the message, which, which is, is there in uh, Scotland, the actual piece of paper says, for God's sake, stop messing around sending these messengers everywhere. The, the, when w by the time they arrive or get back to you, everything that, that they know is out of date. Find a man, uh, uh, an agent called uh, Dennis Chicletera. Dennis has got a radio. Dennis is due to leave the island uh, in the next few days. He's your man. And eventually, they do find, uh, uh, get, um, uh, they get hold of Dennis Chicletera, and th they, f they discover through his radio that already they've missed a, a launch that, had, that was standing off the coast one night, came three nights running to take them off, and they missed it because they didn't know it was there. Lee Fermer again, they kn but they now know that they've got to get to a beach called um, Rodokino. Uh, they know that, uh, that, that, that Dennis will will keep his radio on air, and they start to move it. The Lee Fermer splits his forces again. He takes the general, the slow, difficult route, and he, he reckons that there won't be any Germans guarding that route, and Moss takes another party, the fast, dangerous route, through the um, through a, a German cordons, and his job will be to sort of isolate the beach that they're to go from and defend it uh, if necessary. And, and Lee Fermer starts making fantasy plans about what they would do uh, if if they were attacked. Luckily, they're not attacked. Um, here are some of the Germans, and that's the sort. That's the easy bit of the going. Um, and there's London in the war. Whilst the, whilst the, the, they're escaping, the, the, the Germans are destroying villages. You, they can hear them being blown up. And Lee Fermer always said, "Ah, oh, yes, but that was reprisals for something that happened earlier in the year." But it's you know, it's if it, if you plod a wasp's nest. And the wasps will fly at you. You can't say, "Well, I only prodded that wasp in the middle." Uh, the, you know, the, they, they've, they've stirred up the wasp nest in a in a major way. The general falls down again, and this time he lies on the floor screaming and saying, "I can't take any more. I've had enough. Why don't you just shoot me and have done with it?" And they're all of their nerves are absolutely stretched and they're on on edge. They reach the beach. I won't show any more slides because they're, they're going backwards and forwards. They reach the beach. Uh, and they, they look down on it, and they can see there are German soldiers there playing leapfrog. Uh, and they can see, too, that the, that the Germans have got a small garrison every two kilometers or so, and that they're, that they're linked together by telephone cable. And the general looks down at these, his, his previous command, playing leapfrog, and he, and he says, oh, I sometimes wonder who's in charge of this island, us or you British. Um, and they're now within an ace of getting off. They wait for nightfall. They move to the bit of the beach that isn't guarded at, at Rodokino. And they wait to hear the noise of the launch so that they can signal. And they've been told that the uh, code, code that they should signal, is mi was, which was uh, Monkey King, MK, 
has been changed to sugar baker. And so they stand there, and then they realize that neither of them knows the Morse code for S or B. And Lee Feller says, well, I know S because it's part of SOS, so I'll, I'll signal that, and maybe he'll give us the benefit of the doubt and, and come in. And, of course, they the uh, commander of the launch doesn't give them the benefit of, of, of the doubt because a, 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 a torch just flashing one code word could be a German trap. So they hear the, tor the, the motor launch starting to go away, and then Dennis Chiklatira appears, goes, you bloody fools, grabs the torch out of their hand and flashes Sugar Baker, and, and a dinghy appears. It's full of armed men who are d led by a man called uh, Bob Berry from the Special Boat Service who wants to have a go at the Germans. And he says, look, I tell you what, we'll pretend we never found you, and we'll just go off and fight the Germans. And they Lee Feather says, don't, don't be stupid. Leave all your weapons here for the Cretans, and we'll all get, back, we'll all get on the... Um, on the boat, and that's what they do, and the general is taken to Cairo, they eat uh, lobster sandwiches on the way, and he's debriefed in London, and it's thought that he's a pretty um, uh, unimportant uh, general, and that raises the question of uh, was it worth it. Uh, in terms of morale for the Cretan people, and actually around the world, uh, it's, a great, it's a great feather in the cap of the, of the Allies, but in tactical or strategic terms, uh, it, it, wasn't at all, it wasn't worth it, and there were colossal reprisals, and uh, the Germans dropped this leaflet uh, onto the island, uh, just in case anybody's in any doubt about the, re the reprisals. It said, since the abductors of General Kreiper passed through Anoya, using Anoya as a stopping place when transporting him, we order its raising to the ground and the execution of every male who is found within the village and within an, area, within an area of one kilometer around it. And they did that. That beautiful village was raised to the ground and it wasn't rebuilt until the 60s. And there's a marvelous um, war memorial there. Uh, Moss wrote a book called They All Met by Moonlight, which is his, uh, his um, uh, diary of the event. And Kreiper sued him for defamation of character. And he managed to get the, the book banned in Germany. And he also managed to um, uh, get the film banned in Germany. Later in, Moss died young, Lee Fermer and the general and the surviving kidnappers met in Athens in a, for a television program where they were all interviewed. And there's a lovely uh, photograph of, Moss, of uh, Lee Fermer and the general, men in middle age now who've shared this mad adventure, toasting each other um, below the uh, Acropolis. But for me, uh, as I said to you at the beginning, the real hero of this, or with is, a, is epitomized by Mrs. Dramadanis, and there's a photograph of her, now an old woman, very, very lined face. She's, she's got, she's lost her husband, she's lost friends, she's lost her son. You can see the suffering and you can see the wisdom and you can see the great um, resilience on her face. And well the, 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 uh, so sh for me, she is the sort of, she's the sort of symbol of heroism of the Cretans. And, the last thing is that the man who helped me write this book was a guy called um, uh, Manoli um, Mamalakis, Costas Mamalakis. He's the curator of the historical museum in Crete, and he's also the nephew of one of the kidnappers. He's, in the, he's the nephew of Manoli Patarakis, and he's also a raving lunatic. And when, and when I went to his house, he's got a Vickers machine gun with nine belts of live ammunition, He's got live hand grenades. He's got uh, a, a Bren guns. And I, he said that if, this, if my flat had a fire, I'd ring the fire department and tell them to evacuate the area. And I said, why have you got all this stuff, um, Costas? And he said, well, look, my grandfather had to fight. My great-grandfather had to fight. My father had to fight. And the way things are going, I'm going to have to fight. And at least I'll have the weapons to fight with. And that's the way the Cretans think. And that was the journey that I went on when I went on this in search of General Kreiper and his kidnappers. And that's me. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. If that's really, that's really kind of you. Thank you. If, if anybody has a question, I'd be delighted to answer it. Oh, there is. Sorry, I couldn't see you. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to ask, you say that the uh, real hero of this story is this woman who's now an old woman. I'm sorry, I totally missed who she was she in was the plot. She was the woman. I mean, she's only metaphorically and symbolically the, the, the
the hero. She symbolizes the strength of the Cretan resistance, and she's the woman who was a young woman with her family hiding in the cave in that, that early shot uh, that I showed you. I can't, uh, oh, it's, it's gone off. I, I did have a photograph of her, but the slides haven't, um, haven't gone very well, so I'd you, you, if you saw that photograph, it's in the book, it's, it's a wonderful face, and it's a, it's a, it is the spirit of Crete. So she's n she had nothing to do with the kidnap, but she had everything to do with the resistance. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, cr Crete seems to inspire quite a lot of literature. I'm thinking of Evelyn Waugh's account yes. of the... Um, what do you think it is about Crete that attracts these accounts? And also, on in terms of the book Moss wrote, do you think it was factually inaccurate? Or no, no, no. Um, I mean, uh, uh, Evelyn Waugh was writing about one of the major British disasters of the war, that he was, I think he was a commander himself, and he was there. So it was, it was sort of rich material to write about, and he, was, he wrote about the sort of idiocies of the British army and the, and, the, and, the, and the command structure of the British Army. Also, Crete's an island, and I think that we have some, you know, w uh, the British are an island race, and I think that gives us a, a certain uh, sort of sympathy uh, towards them. And it's very contained. It's a nice place to write about because it's got water all around it. It's small, and it, it's easy to sort of get, get hold of it. Ray uh, Stanley Moss. No, I mean, he, I think there are some things that he exaggerates, and but he, his book is, is quite interesting. It's a little bit disappointing because it's, it's only his diary of what he saw. He didn't know what was going on. He didn't know what the Cretans were saying. He didn't know what the Greeks were saying. And once he'd driven the car, which was an act of great, I mean, don't get me wrong, Lee Fermer, Moss, the kidnappers were all very, very brave and, and glamorous people. Um, but once he'd driven that car out of Heraklion, and that, was a, that took a lot of bottle to do that, there wasn't a lot more for him to do other than to guard the general because he couldn't, if he went away, he wouldn't understand where he was or what was being said to him. So it's quite, a, it's, I mean, obviously I, I would say this, wouldn't I? I mean, I think my book is more interesting, but as a historical document, um, Moss's book is interesting, you know, and I, and I, and I, I used it a lot. As, as I used the books written by several of the uh, Cretan resistance on the same subject. Any other? Yes. Um, you mentioned that uh, strategically the whole mission wasn't uh, of much use and that the general didn't have that much uh, good information. How did British military intelligence get it so wrong? They didn't get it wrong. I mean, I, what I think happened was that Lee Fer Paddy Lee Fermer liked an adventure. And once they'd had the idea of getting Muller, and Muller would have been a much bigger fish to get because he was such a horrible man, he... Well, At the trials, he said, oh, uh, he said, um, ah, yes. He said, you wouldn't have caught me so. Lee Femmer goes to see him. He said, you wouldn't have caught, caught, caught me so easily. And he says, and in any case, he said, generals. He said, we got boxes of generals. He said, when you start to get worried is when you lose your master baker. And that was, he said, and he was hanged the next day. <laughs> so it's quite a lot of sang froid there. But so I think that they didn't, it wasn't, they didn't get it wrong. They just let, they let the kidnap go on because it's, you know, in, in, in sort of economic terms, it's a few men, a car, an aeroplane. It's not very expensive. And if you pull it off, it's a great publicity coup. And, it, and I think it's all very well for me to sit here going, oh, well, it, they had no, it had no strategic importance. It didn't. But it, but it did. Uh, it, everybody thought, oh, great, we've captured the general. That, everybody in the world who heard, out, heard about it, including people in occupied countries, thought, good. And it must have done put the wind up the Germans that, that, that a general could be taken from his own headquarters where, where he should have been at his safest. Rick, what perhaps you might also say is that about how badly things were going at this point. Every, it was just before the successes of the reconquest of Italy and y so on. Yes, I mean, uh, we, had we had by now won in the Western Desert, but nobody knew uh, that D-Day was on the horizon. So uh, you, if, I think if any of us w had been alive at that time, we'd, we could easily think, oh, uh, the Germans are winning this war. They've got much more material. They're, 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 they occupied France. The whole position would change within a few, a few months, but it was pretty glum. I think that pre-D-Day, pre-July the 6th, 1944 period, uh, the 
you know, people have been at war for a long time, they were tired, they were depressed, and they, there was nothing to show. So any little thing that could lift the spirits around the world was a, was a good thing. I went to um, interview Paddy Lee Fermor in his house in Kadamili just about three years before he died and interviewed him about all this. And he said that one of the most depressing moments was when um, they were lying at the top of the mountain. They got the general. They were up on looking onto Mount Eden at that point, moment. Uh, and he said these waves after waves of German planes went overhead, presumably bombing uh, Tobruk or something, the, the, all, all the British positions in North Africa. And yes. they were just, the whole sky was black with this endless, endless fleet of, of, of German planes. And he said, you know, whatever we do, uh, this can only raise the, raise the morale, but it, it seems completely hopeless. This was a moment... I mean, now, of course, we know that, you know, the Allies won, the Germans were defeated, the Nuremberg trials took place. But at this particular moment, the Germans had taken the whole of uh, Europe. Uh, they were advancing down the coast towards Egypt from Libya. They defeated, they took the, 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 the port which Paddy left to for Crete uh, from was captured by the Germans the next day. So this was a moment of imminent defeat. The whole thing looked as it was going to go down terribly. Yeah, you... you uh, you, you could easily argue that, and um, apropos of that, it, you, you mustn't forget how brilliant the Germans were at psychological domination. I mean, they beat the French by psychology. People thought that they were unbeatable. So you see great fleets of bombers going over. You are not aware that the, actually the Germans are right, they are right up against it. They're running out of everything, and Crete is a place that they would have, uh, could have abandoned because it was so difficult to look after, to, to, to keep. But as Willie says, we, at that moment, thought, oh, blimey, we could lose this thing. N six months later, it was all different. The Russians were, uh, were advancing. D-Day had happened, and the Germans were on the back foot. Even then, they nearly, they, ne they could have won the war in towards the end of 1944 and the beginning of 45. Any other questions? Yes, the lady there with the... Oh, the gentleman, that, sorry, with... So this is a bit of a footnote almost in terms of the overall uh, story of the war. Uh, how did you hit upon it? As in, um, you know, I have read a lot of World War II trivia, but I had never come across this. Uh, how did you hit upon this whole story? How did I hear about it? Yeah. Well, as, as uh, Willie said earlier on, I mean, it's that I'm 66, and I grew up on this stuff. I mean, the cockle shell heroes, da tales of daring do, and ill met by moonlight was made in 19... 56, I think, with Dirk Bogart. The book came out in 1953, and, it, you know, capturing a German general is every schoolboy's dream, and all you've got to do is find a car somewhere, and you can start playing capturing the German general. And, uh, you know, and I loved reading those. We've, in uh, the United Kingdom, we've had, we had picture books of, uh, great, you know, soldier stories of the war, and I, and I loved all that sort of thing. How I actually came across it for the second time was that... Uh, I was with my wife in France, and my wife is a publisher, and she's incidentally my publisher at Bloomsbury, but we were thinking of buying a house on Crete, and I'd just finished a book called The Phantom Army of Alamein, which is about the camouflage unit in the Western Desert, and I was very depressed because I thought, oh, well, that, that's it, I've, I've, I'm, and, and I'm a filmmaker. I thought, I won't make any more films now, and I probably won't ever write another book, and in having that doomy, that dreadful thought, I suddenly thought, Crete, we're going to Crete, we're going to buy a house, ill met by moonlight. And it came smashing into my brain in, in that second. And I imme immediately um, got onto Amazon and got the, got the um, book sent to, f to, got ill met by moonlight, sent to France. And that was, the you know, it is a very good story. It's a real tale of daring do. And it's, it, w it, w it was already in my mind. I just had to remember it. And remember it, I did. I had to, and then I had fabulous fun writing it, not least of which was going on to Crete and being treated myself to, to great generosity. The mayor of Anoya gave me a jeep. I was driven all around the mountains and then he gave me an open air barbecue of a, of a goat and lots of wine. And uh, you know, was, I, was, I, w I, had, I had a ball and they're, they're such nice people. And of course, it was wonderful to be in touch with uh, Costas Mamalakis, uh, uh, the nephew of a kidnapper who said, who did say to me, I mean, it, it, brought, brought it made it clear how Th th how serious these vendettas are. He said, look, whatever you do, don't say that I'm the, 
the nephew of a kidnapper. He said, because it could make big problems for me. So in the book, I dedicate the book to him, and I say he knows a lot about it, which he does. I mean, he, he knew things that were happening because his uncle, you know, what happened in the car, his uncle was in the car and told him what, what happened. But I, I dedicate the book to him, and I'm grateful to him, and I mention him in acknowledgments, but I, I don't say that he, and please nobody let this out, that he's the, <laughs> he's the nephew of um, Manoli Pateraki. I think that might be. <coughs> Big round of applause, please, for Rick Stark. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. We wish to thank our speaker, Rick Stroud and William Dalrymple. Thank you very much.